Well, um, I have to tell you all, I really, really appreciate uh, your being here on this most momentous evening. Uh, I promise we'll keep things to uh, an hour because um, I know we've got uh, lots of uh, important developments that we're all waiting to see uh, this evening. But um, we also have a lot of important nature to discuss. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get going. I do have tech support puppy here with me. And yes, he did find the squeaky toy again. So any weird noises you hear in the background, it's not me. It's him because he's on my foot. <laughs> um, but um, let's go ahead and, uh, and get started. And um, we can end on time tonight. All right. uh, we'll get going here with our usual beginning. But um, all right, enough of that. Um, I'm going to briefly recap um, last week's column uh, just because it was kind of a commercial and I hate having to do that, but it's part of the job. Um, I did write about King County Certified Naturalists. I know uh, several of you are familiar with this program now in its, uh, I believe it's 13th year as we go into 2021. Um, and it's, it's uh, something that we started, oh gosh, um, it was, we wanted to be, uh, this is a little behind the scenes gossip, we actually wanted to be Kane County Master Naturalists. Um, some of you might be familiar with the Master Gardener program. And back in the uh, early 2000s, uh, Rock Island County here in Illinois started a Master Naturalist program that just uh, went, um, went crazy the first year they offered it. They had so many adult learners in Rock Island County that wanted to be naturalists. Well, we heard about that and we thought, well, I bet you there's people like that in Kane County too. The only thing is the Master Naturalist Program, um, it's, uh, it's a uh, kind of a copywritten or, or trademark term uh, by Extension, uh, University Extension Services. And here in Illinois, um, the University of Illinois Extension Service was not ready to take Master Naturalist uh, statewide back in this was like i said this was 2005 2006 so um the st charles park district along with the uh, geneva park district and at the time the fox valley park district as well as the forest preserve district um, we got together we worked closely with the extension and we developed a curriculum that was a lot like master naturalist and they said go ahead run with it just don't call it master naturalist so we came up with um, the certified naturalist uh, or certifiable, <laughs> certifiably natural uh, is the other way we like to think of it, uh, term for our group. Uh, and since that time, we've had close to 300 participants that have wanted to learn about nature. Uh, last year, we made this promotion. This will kind of give you an idea visually what the program is about. Um, nope, why didn't it play? Let's try it again. About a minute long. Pam, if there's any talking, we can't hear it. Or is it all just visual? This is all visual. Can you not hear the music? No. Really? Oh, it's so early. I can't hear it, but it's just very faint. Yeah. And I can't hear you because the music's so loud. <laughs> um, I, you know what? We'll just go on to the next slide. I wonder why, because I had a trouble with the audio last week too. Um, there's been a couple of important changes uh, thanks to COVID. We are offering actually uh, three different versions of the class this year. 
We have um, the traditional in-person <laughs> classes and field trips, and we will be following all the COVID protocols that are in place at that time. Uh, right now, if, if things stay the way they are right now, we'll be able to have a class of up to 25 people in a room that would normally hold up to 150, so everybody will be spaced out. Uh, <laughs> Spaced out physically. I don't know if we spaced out mentally. <laughs> I guess if we, you know, that can happen too. Um, but we're also going to try uh, virtual classes as well. We're going to do the program in its entirety virtually. Um, that's uh, six weeks of classes. Um, uh, and then we will be doing the field trips in person because we can space uh, and be outdoors and have the ventilation that uh, makes us safer. Uh, so that will be option B. And then our third option, we'll be doing the classes uh, strictly virtually uh, via Zoom. No field trips. Uh, you won't get the certification if you opt for that uh, virtual only um, method, uh, but you'll still learn an awful lot about the, uh, the nature here in Kane County. Um, the, uh, the program runs uh, a year. The cool thing about it is that once you finish those, what we call the core classes and the field trips, then you're then responsible or uh, you're uh, eligible to take all of our uh, learn from the experts classes, um, which we call the LFEs. Some of you might know we also call them learn from the eccentrics, um, but th those are offered throughout. We usually have uh, four or five, something like that each quarter on all sorts of topics, um, tree ID, uh, we usually focus on a few of lo the local mammals. I know uh, coming up this winter, we're going to be doing some, uh, some more takes. We do a, a tracking class a lot of times this year. We're going to do a little spin on tracking where we look, uh, we're going to try and identify bird's nests in one of our classes. Uh, so there's just all different uh, kinds of opportunities to take advantage of local nature. Uh, there is a fee for the course. Uh, it's $300 for the year, but that uh, would include all of those, um, the core classes and the field trips and the um, uh, LFEs. Uh, or if you want to do the virtual only, the six, um, the six uh, core classes virtually, that's uh, just $100. So, um, if you want more information, feel free to let me know. Um, that's really all I'm going to say about it. Like I said, it's a little commercial that I have to do every year. But I thought um, that this knowledge might help you a little bit more. Um, if you become a Kane County Certified Naturalist, you are going to be able to take a completely different spin on things like Halloween candy. Uh, I'm going to cut off the slideshow here for a minute. And uh, I'm going to go back to full screen and um, let you know of a little experience I had yesterday. Uh, I was walking to work, um, my naturalist brain on which I really have trouble always turning off. Um, and I saw this on the sidewalk. Can you see that? Someone uh, in our neighborhood must have been handing out Kiwanis peanuts for their Halloween treats. So. Um, I actually just left it there, which is kind of, if you know me, that's not like me. If there's free food, I'm all over it. <laughs> but <laughs> the ground for a while. And uh, I thought, mm. I was also a little bit curious, too, as a naturalist to see if, um, oops, uh, Mary, it looks like you're sharing your screen again. <laughs> um, can you guys still see this? No. No? Okay. Mary, can uh, no. Let's see. We'll see if we can turn that off again. There we go. All right. So, um, so I left it. And I walked to work again this morning. And the peanuts were still there. And I thought, you know what? This, that's kind of strange. I wonder why nothing, I was, I seem to be the only thing interested in eating these things. Why didn't any animals want to eat free peanuts? And then I started looking at this package and it is so well sealed. I actually brought it home with me and I let my dog sniff it. And there is no peanut odor. There's nothing from this bag. So um, I may actually put it back out again and see if anything wants to take it. I'll put it on my deck this time so I can keep a little closer eye on it. Um, but so 
this morning as I'm walking to work, I'm now thinking about uh, Halloween candy, and you wouldn't believe how much I found. Um, I found some bubble yum, and I looked at it, and it too is, is tightly sealed. There's no bubble gum odor. It passed my dog's smell test. They were not interested in it either. Um, I found, this is a uh, Tootsie Fruit Chew. Um, it's not very tightly wrapped. Uh, my dogs sniffed it. They could smell, I think. I mean, they were, they were kind of interested. I think they could tell that it was something to eat. Um, and they, actually my one dog, Kit, did want to eat it. But I thought it was interesting, no wild animals went after this free food that was out on the sidewalk. Um, so I might, like I said, I might leave this on my deck too and see tonight if anything comes uh, when I get home to sample the Tootsie Fruit Chew. Uh, and then I came across this. This is a Tootsie Roll. And again, not very tightly wrapped. And clearly something has been eating it. Here's, it's about half of the Tootsie is gone. And I started looking at the wrapper and how it was chewed. And so I, I, and then you think, you know, what's around that's going to eat Tootsie Rolls? Um, then this is, probably has been on the ground since Halloween. Uh, I didn't eat it, it wasn't me. That's one clue. <laughs> I was pretty sure it probably uh, was. <laughs> So I started looking, and I'm going to hold this up to the screen uh, camera here so you can see it. There's some, there's some small perforations um, in the wrapper. It doesn't look gnawed, though, the way a squirrel or a chipmunk might it. This does not look like um, a mammal chew. Um, I mean, it doesn't look like, I'm sorry, a rodent chew. It, it's definitely a mammal who chewed on this. And I started thinking, who's our usual suspects that eat candy in the neighborhood? Well, one would be the raccoon. Here's a raccoon skull, and here's raccoon teeth. The skull is missing a couple, but um, see how the incisors here are pretty flat, and they're pretty large too. If a, if a raccoon was going to eat a Tootsie Roll, I don't one, I don't think there'd be much left of it. And I don't think that these chew marks would be so um, dainty and pointy. <laughs> and I thought, well, who else in our neighborhood is walking around looking for candy to eat besides me and besides raccoons? Um, I'm thinking it was this animal here. Now this is an opossum. And you'll notice now, this skull happens to be missing the incisors. In fact, if you ever find an opossum skull and you find it all intact, let me know. Because opossums, for some reason, they're, they're, their skulls are flimsy. They don't tend to hold up well. Um, the reason I know this is a raccoon, uh, opossum skull, not a raccoon skull, is um, look at this, uh, this deep, uh, tall ridge that's on the top. That, that, this is the only mammal that has that, uh, that kind of a ridge. The, uh, I believe it's called the occipital. Mm -hmm. um, and look at how pointy these teeth are. A raccoon's teeth are a little bit more blunt. And again, they're, they're quite a bit larger. Um, I know for a fact in our neighborhood, we have a lot of uh, first year opossums seem to see them pretty frequently. They stay out of my yard because of the dogs, but I'll uh, see them around, and I know our, our neighbor has had them around as well. Uh, so I'm thinking that our Tootsie bandit in the neighborhood was an opossum. So if you take KCCN, <laughs> Those are the kind of thoughts that are going to be plaguing your brain all the time. That's also, you might find, um, or my excuse anyway, for being late all the time. <laughs> I'm always thinking about these kinds of things, and I find them irresistible. So 
Um, just something to think about if you, I know a lot of you have taken the course, but if you haven't, it's certainly something that might be an option for you as we get into our, our cold weather months in uh, January and February. Um, right. Next support puppy got into something he shouldn't have. I'm not sure what that was, but hopefully he's done with it now. <laughs> he was doing a lot of ripping and tearing. Um, all right, let's go back. Uh, let's go back to our slideshow. Um, and we're going to pick up uh, with our next topic, uh, which is uh, witch hazel. How many of you are familiar with this phenomenal plant? Uh, it's, uh, it's a shrub uh, that at one time I think was fairly common in our understory in a lot of our uh, woodland areas. And now it, it shows up from time to time. A lot of times people choose to plant it. Um, Starved Rock, I actually took this picture at Starved Rock a couple of years ago. Um, there's a, a pretty uh, abundant amount of witch hazel uh, when you walk around the woods at Starved Rock. What's cool about it, um, one of its many fine qualities, is that it blooms in the fall. Um, now you might think, you know, why, what's the advantage there? Um, most plants want to bloom in the spring and summer when there's plenty of pollinators, but it turns out there's quite a few uh, moths uh, that are attracted to witch hazel, and moths are a pretty cold hardy insect. Um, in our area, we've got a, a number of species that are able to fly around even after we've had some frost. So, um, Witch hazel is uh, pollinated by moths. Um, and it's kind of neat. Uh, the, the Latin hemimalis is actually, it refers to another plant called medlar. And it, uh, medlar does not grow in the United States, but people who were naming plants back in the day thought that witch hazel uh, bore a resemblance to <laughs> called medlar. Um, but what I thought was really interesting was the witch hazel part, uh, which it actually has nothing to do with, with witches or sorcery, but um, the etymology traces it back to the words wit and witch uh, for lively and bend, and it refers to the practice of using a forked witch hazel branch to um, douse for water. Um, this was a practice that was pretty common back when um, our country was being settled and witch hazel was mm -hmm. the uh, plant of choice that was used for dousing. Um, now, I was lucky enough today, I'm going to stop this share again. I did find a witch hazel plant that's in bloom. Check out these delicate blossoms here. Aren't those just the coolest? Um, these little spider-like, um, almost confetti-like petals are going to fall off, and then these uh, sepals that are down towards the base, um, those are going to hang on even longer than the petals do. So sometimes you can even see these after the snow has come down. And uh, Sue Wagner, I got to tip my hat to you. Um, you had posted some pictures on Facebook of witch hazel, and I thought, what a, what a fantastic plant to be able to... Uh, showcase and give people uh, a reason to go out looking. Um, if you want an easy way to find it, you can go out to the front of Hickory Knolls. We have some blooming there and we also have some in the native plant garden behind uh, Potawatomi. Or you can test your naturalist skills and see if you can pick some out in some of our uh, rich woodland areas. Um, I, I stole this little sprig because in addition to this year's flowers, it has one of last year's seed pods. And this is about ready to open. Um, not quite ready. Um, what happens is it takes about a year for the seeds to form. And witch hazel is one of uh, a handful of plants that um, builds up uh, a pressure. And when the seed pod opens, it opens with a force that will send the seeds that are inside. I believe there's two seeds in this pod and they are gonna fling anywhere from 10 to 20 feet away. It's really cool. Um, 
uh, like I said, this one isn't isn't quite ready yet, but it takes um, takes quite a while for those pods uh, to form. This was from where last year's blossom was. So, um, uh, if you're really lucky when you're out on your witch hazel hunt, if you um, happen to come upon one on a day when it's ready to start spreading its seeds out, you could really be in for a treat. So. Uh, something else to be mindful of and to watch out for uh, now that we've gotten into fall. Has anybody else seen that? Um, those of you who are um, card carrying nature nerds, have you ever been able to see um, or time your hikes just right where you've seen witch hazel opening? It's got to be, um, you know, with um, uh, jewelweed, that's a plant, some people call it touch me not. You can actually inspire the plant. Uh, you can touch the pods when they're ripened and they'll fling right in front of your eyes. This is going to take a little bit more doing. And I, like I said, I don't think it's, it's quite ready yet. But um, witch hazel, it's happening in woods near you right now. Now, let me go back. I've got another uh, slide to share. Um, another plant. Um, that's uh wait miss pam yes uh -huh. does it do it on its own or does it need it does it on its own as it dries out um i'm gonna guess that maybe the uh and, and if, if anybody knows the mechanism behind it feel free to chime in but i'm thinking that the uh uh the the pod dries out to a point where it just kind of um pops open with with jewelweed, I know it's a fluid pressure thing, and I think with the um, witch hazel, it might be the opposite. It might be uh, because of uh, just the dryness of the pod that causes it to open up. The seeds are small and shiny and dark, um, and they, like I said, they fling um, a pretty good distance. It's one of the reasons when, when you come upon a, a natural stand of witch hazel, it, it tends to, it's a, it's a shrub that tends to grow in clumps um, and because those seeds, try as it might to fling really far, it, it really can't go more than 10. I think I read one, one account said they can go up to 20 feet, but that's still in terms of the acreage of a woodland that's not all that far. So. Uh, witch hazel does tend to, to grow in clumps that way. Um, I was uh, reminded of this other um, current nature happening during this uh, same walk to work this week. Uh, when I got over my fixation with Halloween candy, I started looking up and I saw um, this tree. Turn the sound down. Um, so Kentucky coffee tree, it's, um, it's pretty common here in St. Charles and I would imagine other municipalities make use of it too, uh, as a, a tree that they plant. Uh, it's probably, it's got two nice qualities that municipalities find, um, attractive. One, it, um, has a very sparse branching habit, so uh, it provides shade in the summer, but then it also lets um, a lot of light in in the fall. Um, and uh, fall and winter. And um, two, it is very salt tolerant. So you see these planted on a lot of medians. I know uh, along Randall Road, you'll see them planted uh, where salt spray is a, a very um, real problem and it kills a lot of different kinds of trees, but Kentucky coffee can actually withstand a fair amount of, of salt spray and do just fine. Um, the one drawback is from a municipality standpoint are um, these many pods. Now this year doesn't seem to be as big of a year as uh, this was last year's Kentucky coffee crop. Um, the reason it gets its name, and I'm going to stop the share again because I happen to have a pod right here. Um, these pods, uh, they're very um, leathery and they're also um, kind of messy. So city streets uh, re requires quite a bit of cleanup if they uh, happen to have uh, a plant that um, is not sterile and is bearing fruit like this. Um, I don't know if you can hear the seeds rattling inside. 
something did try to chew on this, but I tell you, this is not a real popular um, food for animals like squirrels because the inside is a little bit toxic. There's a chemical in here called cytosine. Um, and even though the, there's a pulp, you can see this, um, let me try to open it up a little bit more. Um, there's a sticky green pulp inside, oh yeah, it's sticky. Uh, sticky green pulp inside, uh, and it kind of encases these large seeds. And these seeds have a really tough covering on them. Um, it's a lot of work to get to it, and um, you can also get, if you're a small rodent like a squirrel, you can get kind of sick chewing on that, um, that pulp. Um, so, so animals don't really disperse these seeds. Um, Kentucky coffee in this day and age really kind of relies on humans uh, to move it around. Now, there are parts of the country that um, have pretty large stands of Kentucky coffee. Uh, this, and the reason it got its name is because you, you can roast these these seeds and grind them up and you can make a coffee-like beverage. The roasting will um, uh, kind of nurture um, or um, neutralize the toxin, the cytosine, and make a coffee-like beverage from this. Um, these were also, um, in Native American times, these seeds were used uh, to play different games. They were game pieces. They were almost uh, used kind of like dice for certain games too. So uh, there is a, a cultural history there that could have led to some of these stands of Kentucky coffee in other parts of the country. Um, now, some books that you read about Kentucky coffee, they will also refer to this as an evolutionary anachronism which means um, it at one time was important um, in area ecology and it has uh, kind of lost its niche. Now, um, with that said, I am going to, tech support puppies coming up to say hi. <laughs> yeah, hi buddy. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I'm gonna go back to the slideshow here. Does anybody wanna guess um, and some of you who have taught our programs, you already know the answer. Uh, what animals did used to disperse this plant? Because this was actually, um, it figured into the diet of animals uh, at one time. Uh, most plants will have a dispersal agent, um, a, an animal. If not an animal, it'll be the wind or the water. But Plants always need a way to get their seeds to move around. And in the case of Kentucky coffee, uh, that gooey pod that I mentioned that is slightly toxic, it's also quite sweet. So there was a little bit of an enticement there for these animals. Let's go back to the slideshow. Um, and we'll uh, move ahead. Um, to these guys. Um, now I use the mastodon because the mastodon was present here in Keene County. Uh, truth be told, we don't know exactly what the uh, megafauna of the Pleistocene era, which specific ones ate Kentucky coffee, but this was um, a plant that uh, was around during the ice age and it, um, it needed um, a way to get moved around, and it was these animals that did it. The, the mastodon, the, the giant ground sloth, um, these were the animals that would feed on plants like this. Uh, another similar plant that is also called an evolutionary anachronism would be a plant we talked about a couple weeks ago, the Osage orange, those big sticky um, green pods that nothing eats today, actually had animals back in the ice age that would disperse them. So. Um, kind of a cool reminder, you probably aren't thinking about um, mastodons when you're driving down Randall Road and you see Kentucky coffee trees on the median, but um, that's where the history of this plant lies. Kind of cool. So oh, um, let's go on to, um, this was a, uh, actually a Facebook correspondence that I received uh, this past week. Uh, this um, 
comes from a, a family that lives out in Caneville. And it started with this one picture. And the family was guessing either a coyote or a fox. And that's that whole, it's hard to tell the exact dimensions. There's no um, scale there, but it, it was a good sized hole. You can tell by the amount of debris um, that's been kicked out of it. Um, the thing is that coyotes and foxes aren't typically digging at this time of the year. Uh, they, um, don't, you, they don't make a home the way we think of homes where they would you know, have a place to go every night. Occasionally foxes will dig a den uh, for shelter in the winter time, but uh, it's, just like, it's just a weird time to find an excavation this fresh by a fox or a coyote. They will dig what we call a natal den, and that will be in March and April when they're having their pups, uh, but it's November. So um, we did some messaging back and forth, and one of the, um, the questions I asked her was, um, is there more than one? And she said, well, as a matter of fact, yes, her son, um, the woman's son is a, a student at Caneland High School. He'd found two fresh holes and he'd found two older holes as well. Um, so just to give you an idea of the habitat, this is where they live. Uh, they're um, surrounded by uh, agricultural fields and there's a little buffer here. Um, if we go back and look, you can see the soil is pretty sandy, so it's easy to dig in. Um, and then uh, her son went out and took some pictures. And we've got some, some footprints here, and we've got some scat. Now, I got to tell you, when I looked at these footprints, I count one, two, three, four toes, and one, two, three, four claws. Um, but these are not textbook, you know, when you, when you look at tracking books, there's always these perfect pictures, um, and coyotes and foxes do have four toes, and then they'll have, usually they'll have a heel pad back here, and I don't really see a good image of a, uh, imprint of a heel pad here, which is kind of weird, um, and these claws look kind of long, especially this one here, this is quite a scrape, um, and then here's the scat. And if you look close, you can see the scat has a lot of hair in it. But this is not coyote scat and this is not fox scat. Um, when um, coyotes and foxes leave scat behind, they are quite, um, their digestive system do a lot of churning. There's a lot of twisting. And then they always use this, uh, leave this distinctive little, um, point on the end. I call it the Dairy Queen swirl, but, uh, and I thought this, <laughs> this was a picture I took uh, this past spring. I don't like it to me. What? Oops, I'm sorry. I thought I yeah. was on mute. I'm talking to Jessica. Oh, you're fine, Suze. <laughs> um, so I took this picture last spring. This was uh, some fox scat. It's fairly narrow. Uh, this was on a boardwalk out at Otter Creek Bend. But if we go back and look, um, there's no um, twists or twirls on this scat, uh, but there is fur in it, which would indicate that it's kind of a carnivore. So um, not sure if these tracks belong to the digger. Pretty sure this scat does. Um, this is the habitat. And that's the hole. Does anybody want to guess what we might be looking at here? Badger. Oh, sure. That's hole. what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Ooh. So um, we don't have any conclusive evidence yet. And I did contact Bill Grazer. He's the wildlife biologist for Kane County. This property where this family lives is actually very close to Almond Underwood uh, Prairie Forest Preserve. Um, and the, uh, the habitat there is good, not just for badgers, but for the badger's food, which um, is primarily 13-line uh, ground squirrels. Those holes that um, the son had found, the, the, one of the keys too is that there was multiple holes. Uh, again, if we, if we look at our other diggers, the coyote and the fox, they're gonna be digging um, A, at this time of year, and B, just one hole. 
Um, and multiple holes usually means a badger is foraging for food. Now badgers, they only dig um, a natal den uh, and, and, and return to that den every night when they're raising their young. Um, the rest of the year, they're pretty mobile. They're digging uh, in a lot of different places looking for food. So the fact that the, this family has found multiple holes uh, at the back of their property and the, the soil is easy to dig through um, is kind of having me thinking badger. Now, won't know um, for sure for a while. I've, I've asked them to see if they can um, get a game camera set up. I've also asked Bill Grazer if he wants to put up a a game camera to see if he can catch some activity out there. But um, you know, uh, Almond Underwood, I took the kids to go see it because I read about how it was an important remnant prairie. Uh -huh. I went to see it and actually my foot got stuck in one of the holes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> holes like that. So just for reference on how big the holes are, we found a whole bunch of them. I didn't know what it was. But I actually got my my the front of my foot inside. It yeah, they, because it's hilly and it was very tall in vegetation, and so we couldn't really see the. And we had boots and everything, so we were fine. And down you went. Oh gosh, Savannah, were you okay? <laughs> yeah, no, I was fine. It was just it was a big hole. Yeah, exciting. Yeah, they are. I would say I don't know eight to ten inches across. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and again, it's the badger isn't digging to make a home, they're digging to get to the animal's home, the, uh, the uh, ground squirrel's home. So, and then once they find one, they'll, they'll eat it, and then they might rest in that hole, but then they're gonna move on to another one, hence the, the number, of, um, you know, number of holes that you might find if there's badger activity. Now these two pictures, these are actually, um, uh, King County badgers uh, that were uh, in Hampshire, Illinois. This These date back a few years, but a, a reader had sent me these uh, because this was at the back of her property, which looks very, very much like the, the property uh, out near Caneville. It, she abutted an ag field. In fact, you can see the soybeans in the back of this photo here. This was a mama badger, and I believe she had, uh, it was either two or three, um, little offspring that she raised here at the back of that woman's party. So it does happen. Um, badgers are um, kind of occasional uh, residents. Are, they are residents in this area. They're only occasionally seen though. So I will keep you updated. We're still in the process of gathering some information, but gives you some food for thought when you're out and about. And thanks for that tip, Silvana. If you happen to be near um, soil that um, is easy to dig in and uh, would support animals like ground squirrels, uh, there's a, a, a decent uh, enough chance that you might also be in badger country, which is not to be confused with Wisconsin. Uh, <laughs> so now um, you guys are going to take part in a little experiment with me. Uh, I'm going to stop the share again um, because I learned something uh, the other day try to learn something new every day. But this, I got to tell you, it really kind of blew my mind. I, again, I was, I was on Facebook, and I know Facebook is not um, a lot of fake news on Facebook. But um, I was reading an article, um, maybe some of you have seen it, about uh, platypus and how they've determined, you know, platypus, they're those duck-billed mammals that have venomous spurs, and they're just, they only Australia would come up with an uh, animal that's got that many unique qualities. Well, now they found that uh, under uh, ultraviolet light, uh, platypuses also uh, fluoresce, uh, have a fluorescent quality to them. They will give off, um, they reflect um, UV rays, and they don't know why this is the case with platypuses. But um, there was a link in this article that said, Another animal has this quality as well. And it's actually an animal that we talked about last week. The flying squirrel. Sorry, <laughs> this has been in the freezer. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, Hickory Knolls since 2012. <laughs> when it, if you don't remember 2012, that was our drought year. I think this little guy just got dehydrated. I found him at the base of a tree behind the nature center. But this, this is an actual southern flying squirrel um, that died 
in 2012. Well, so I read this article and I remember we had this in the freezer and I hopped onto Amazon and got a black light. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn the lights off and we're going to see if we can see the fluorescence on the Southern Flying Squirrel. So bear with me just a second. I'm gonna turn the lights off. How cool is that? All right. Still with me? Okay. Okay, here's our flying squirrel. Wow, okay. Um, can you see that? Um, uh, okay, there. See the pink? Uh, yeah. Is the fluorescence coming off of the flying squirrel? Um, you don't. You don't get that with regular light. I'm going to put. Um, hold on. Got to see where I put. There's my cell phone. Hold on. Um, Okay, there's regular light. No glowing, but with the, you see that glow? Isn't that awesome? So um, the researchers, uh, the, this was only discovered, I, the, the paper was in the Journal of Mammalogy uh, last year, 2019. This is kind of a recent discovery by mammologists. And they don't know why they do this. How did they ever do this? Uh, anybody have any theories? Why would a flying squirrel have this quality? I could do this all night, sorry. <laughs> Um, I'll turn the light back on. Think on that for a second. So flying squirrels are highly nocturnal. And I wish this guy was in a little bit better shape. They have enormous dark eyes. So I'm guessing that their night vision is pretty good. I'm gonna put him back. I'm gonna put him back in his plastic bag and I'm gonna hope tech support puppy doesn't get a hold of him. Um, I'm wondering if maybe they can see UV with their very large eyes that are adapted to seeing in the dark. And I wonder if they just have that so they can see each other. I don't know, it wouldn't uh, pay to advertise yourself to predators. These guys are, um, I would imagine, pretty tasty morsels and I would think an owl or something would wanna get a hold of them if they could. But I don't, I don't know that owls can see uh, UV like that. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a recent finding. You can, you can um, look the article up or if you're interested, um, let me know and I can send you the link to it. It's a very short article because it, really all it says is, hey, we found flying squirrels do this cool thing. We don't know why yet. And in scientific language, I think they said it bears further investigation. But I thought that was kind of a cool update to um, what was one of our features from last week. So, always something uh, new to wonder about. Um, I'm gonna go, go back, um, see we're starting to get on time here, but I, I wanted to go, um, back to our slides because we have one more thing. We're gonna put your thinking caps on. Um, we get lots of, lots of emails here at Good Natured World Headquarters. And this one came in the other day and I, I, it really kind of got me thinking for a little bit. And I wanna see where your brain goes with this. Uh, goes, Pam, I have a question to pose to you. 
We've been seeing this bird at our feeders for the last two weeks. We were grand dog sitting two weeks ago and I had the chihuahua, I love all the details, chihuahua out for potty run and I was right next to the one bird feeder when this bird flew in. It was one foot from me and looking me in the eye. So I, I emphasized here, I, I did this, this was not in the original email. She said that the bird had blue gray feathers on its back and tail, a small black stripe between its eyes and the breast was dark ivory with a patch of peach colored spot, uh, the size of a quarter. It is a woodpecker, but one I've never seen before. The beak is long and was looking at me and I said, hello. <laughs> and it started heating from the suet feeder, hanging upside down like the rest of the woodpeckers do, but still eyeing me. It also had a little touch of peach around its eyes. It stayed there until I took the dog in. Is it a woodpecker that's not native to this area? It's also pretty. We have downies, harries, and flickers. I admit these birds are all easy to watch. It's just all the things they do. We have a safe Halloween. Yeah, so lots of information there. Um, does anybody want to take a guess as to what this bird was? Anybody? Um, I, I tell you, it's not a bird that we see here all the time. It was, she's right, it is unusual. Uh, it's not a bird that nests around here. Um, this is a good time of year to spot it, um, if it is going to be in this area. And it also helps if you've got conifers in your yard. Conifers and bird feeders are actually ideal to spot this bird. So conifers, um, Pine trees, fir trees, spruce trees. Any guesses? Any guesses? Blue gray feathers, black stripe between its eyes, patch of peach colored spot. Pam, is it a bluebird? Good guess. It is not a bluebird. Um, the bluebird, now, bluebird would. Um, they would come to the feeder if maybe you were offering mealworms or maybe if you had um, uh, berry bushes nearby. Um, but a bluebird probably wouldn't be spotted eating bird seed or suet. Well, actually, I take that back. I have seen a bluebird eat suet. But the, um, uh, the long beak would be another clue. All right. Kingfish family? Pardon me? In the kingfish family? Kingfisher, no. Uh, not a kingfisher. Um, I accidentally just gave the answer away. It is a <laughs> red-breasted nuthatch. <laughs> oh. Oh. Cool. So, um, so, yeah, long be and, and that's what's so fun about these emails, because it, it really gets my brain thinking about all these different possibilities. And... Um, also, the, the fact that, that emailing is just so much easier these days, um, dropping in pictures and everything. These were some photos I had on file here. This was a red-breasted nuthatch that had shown up uh, out in Mill Creek. You can see it was wintertime. This was a couple of years ago. Um, what the, this reader had said about the bird uh, eyeing it, um, nuthatches and chickadees are two species that can actually be um, uh, not really tamed, but they will get so used to being around people that you can, um, if you sit very still, you can feed them out of your hand. Um, I've had friends who have uh, been more patient than me who've taken bird seed and put that, uh, put a big brimmed hat on and put the bird seed on the brim of their hat and they'll sit uh, below the bird feeder and the birds will come and feed off their hat. So um, kind of another cool party trick that you can do with these uh, <laughs> visitors from the north. So, so they're coming down here uh, in, in some numbers. Um, I, like I said, they're, they're not something that every yard gets and it really does help if you have um, some kind of evergreen in the yard, a spruce or a per, uh, fir or a pine. Um, Cause that's where they, that's what would be in their uh, natural habitat up north. Um, and they are drawn to, to bird feeders and um, black oil, sunflower seeds, and suet. So um, 
that is something to keep your eye on because they they're starting to show up in this area. So well, here, my daughter was like, "Mommy, I told you it was a nut hatch, oh. uh, but you said it was not common." But we have them all the time. I actually have a a little a little a house, but it's clear and you can attach it to the window. And I put seeds in it. And when I'm doing the dishes, they come right to it and eat and fly away. And they're yeah. here all the time. The red-breasted? Red-breasted? Yes. yes. I'm no kidding. That's awesome. Well, um, I, I, they might have some that breed around here. Um, but they are typically a bird of the north. But is this at your new house, Silvana? Yeah. Yeah. The, the nut hatches and the, the chickadees come right to that window. It's right next to my window. And they come right in. They look at me. They eat something. They fly away. And they're not like quiet. They're they're loud. And they uh -huh. land hard on it. And they look around for the right one to pick. And it's when you so said it was rare, I was like, no, it can't be. That one is rare. But we see them all the time. Well, so, OK, then you've got an assignment. <laughs> You're going to see if you can eat get them to feed out of your hand and we want photographic evidence. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so work on it. It's like I said, the, the certain birds um, and, and chickadees are one and nuthatches are the other that I, I, I've not been able to do it myself because I twitch. I have trouble sitting still. I get distracted. I get bored. But um, uh, give it a try. And see uh, see if you can actually you know like black oil sunflowers is a good way to get them to come in. Um, and if they're coming already to your window and they're they've got you know they can see you, then you're halfway there. Yeah, they there there is some conifers nearby, but what we have right in front of our house where they go land and then come to us is a birch tree, and okay. they can stay on it and then fly towards us. And you know you can go outside by the front of the house, right where that window is. And they keep on coming and going. They, they don't mind if we're there. That's so I so think, yeah, we're very close. Birch would be another northern species that might be uh, something that they would find um, you know, usual or normal. For I bet hers are white breasted. Like so. Like so. <laughs> so yeah, see if you can get us uh, get get one to to uh, feed out of your hand, and then take a picture. All right, so you got homework. You got good natured homework. <laughs> so uh, with that, that's um, that's pretty much what we've got for this evening. Um, next week we're going to uh, be looking at a uh, seasonal phenomenon that some people get, some people like me get really excited about. Some other people completely freak out about and that is um, snakes that are looking for a place to spend the winter. So uh, we're going to focus in on a couple of those species and uh, share some stories. Uh, I've got some more emails that we weren't able to get to tonight that I want to share with you and uh, who knows there might be more late-breaking nature news like uh, things that uh, glow in the dark. <laughs> I um, really appreciate you spending this election night with us. Um, whatever candidates you're pulling for, hope they win. And um, does anybody have anything for the good of the group? Well, one thing that I was going to say, thinking about that, um, that light that we were shining on the flying squirrels, we went to a museum, I think it was a field museum, and they put those lights on scorpions, and they also oh, yeah. Kind of have that effect, that, you know, they radiate yes. that light back. And that's would be like a nocturnal thing. Also. That was one of the uses um, listed. Uh, that's why I, I bought this particular one because it casts a beam about 20 feet. So, um, and they said, yeah, um, one of the reviews said that um, they had just moved to Arizona and they bought one to see if there were any scorpions in the yard. Um, I have a good friend that that retired. Uh, well, Sarah, to, you know Kim Gerard. Uh, she moved out to Sedona and um, was not a big scorpion fan, but actually uh, got a job working in the Grand Canyon and has learned how to spot scorpions with this uh, pretty well. Um, so yeah, it's a handy gadget. There, um, I think it was the Peggy Notabart Museum had an exhibit. Um, where they had black light on different species of butterflies and the colors that we see the butterfly having are completely different 
um, in the UV spectrum. So um, I anticipate lots of uses for this. Um, and uh, you might not be the last time you see the UV on good nature. <laughs> Anybody else? Hey, Pam. Uh -huh. Oh, hey, Laura. Hi. Um, going way back to witch hazel, um, yeah. doesn't that have a lot of medicinal properties? Or am I thinking of something else? No, it does. Yeah, it's, uh, I believe it's, is it an astringent? Um, Dr. Sarah, I don't know if you're still listening in, but you know, I, witch hazel, uh, the first time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> a tech support puppies right here with us too. Um, I'm, I ever heard of witch hazel, I had just bonked my head. I was about six years old and I was um, actually chasing our new puppy around the house, not watching where I was going. And I ran right into the corner of one of the doorways and got a big old egg right here. And my mom said, oh, I better get the witch hazel out. And um, I know it's, um, I've heard that it shrinks hemorrhoids. I think it, it I, I don't know exactly what the, uh, you know, medical quality but yes, um, there are, um, it is so, and you, yeah, you can buy witch hazel in the store. That's a derivative from the plant. Yeah, that's what I, I thought. <laughs> they re recommended it to me. You can find water with the, uh, with the, yeah. <laughs> and, um, I'll try that too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh. All right. And Pam, Pam, I have a question also about witch hazel. Yeah. Because um, uh, mine, the one I have one this year and it's just beautiful. And last year it had like about three. Are they sort of biennial or is it just to think it was the weather? That's a good question, Kim. I don't know. I know that that the seeds take two years to form, or not? Yeah. They they take a year to form. I, um, is that that my computer one? Uh, I um. And Miss Bonnie, I don't know if you know about witch hazel blooming um, tendencies, but I, I thought that they bloomed every year. Yeah, uh, it's just that last year it just had about three, three flowers, and I thought, oh, that's odd. And this year it's beautiful. This year it's going well. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know if they're because I know, you know, like our um, uh, our mass trees, like our oaks and our. Mm -hmm and our walnuts and everything they have big years there's a big mass right. year there's little ones and, and maybe um uh, the fruiting shrubs do something similar um maybe yeah, we have a lot of rain so it wouldn't have been and this year we didn't so i don't know yeah. if, you know how know. mother would have played a role in that but that's an interesting question kim that i gotta say i don't have the final answer on um, and the only other thing I was going to say is I did plant a Kentucky coffee tree to attract the mastodons and it hasn't worked. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you have a homework assignment too. <laughs> I'm going to keep Let trying. Let know. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Anybody else? Um, if not... Uh, thank you so much again for your time this evening, and I uh, look forward to uh, getting good natured again a week from now. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank good night, Pam. <laughs>